shaping up to be a really good event. The interest has been high, and uh, we're very excited to have you here with us. Uh, we're going to begin today's session. Well, let me give you just uh, some background uh, on what we're going to be doing today. Uh, as breeders, you guys have, uh, have found rather quickly that we're experiencing some really, really strong demand for beef master genetics being bought on by a lot of different factors. But uh, we're, we're right in the middle of a tremendous growth period for the market for beef master bulls. And with that in mind, uh, the topics for today's educational session have been designed to help you as breeders uh, understand and get a better handle on how to develop bulls properly to fit the market that our commercial cattlemen are looking for, how to promote these cattle, effectively and how to prepare basically there's a lot of uh, nutrition work and uh, other avenues that go into effective cell cattle preparation and marketing these cattle and obviously nutrition is a very important part of that. With that in mind we're very very fortunate today. Uh, Purina Land O'Lakes has stepped up. They've been uh, one of our largest sponsors and uh, I asked them to do a session on, on bull development and I jokingly told Dr. Carmen I said this right here on that screen, you know what? Our bulls are breeding his dog, literally. And there's a lot of them out there. And I get really excited about it when you shop and look at all of those kind of cattle that, that need a shot of beef factor to make their dog much more you know, aggressive. So uh, we've got Dr. Chance Farmer with us today uh, with Purina Land Lakes. Uh, he's a nutritionist. I've had the pleasure of attending many workshops listening to Dr. Farmer, this is one of the really skilled nutritionists in the entire beef industry. Uh, every time I sit through one of his presentations, I'll learn a lot. So Dr. Farmer, chance to come on up here and, and, and uh, unload some knowledge on the circle. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, yeah, I was... Uh, a little hesitant to put a picture of Nate's bull up on the title slide of the Beefmaster presentation, but uh, I did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're actually, my family's in the seed stock business, we're in the Amos and Sim Amos business, and I can tell you that we love Beefmaster females. Because when we sell Angus bulls or Sim Angus bulls, because of those kind of females, they're a very happy customer at the end of the day. I can tell you, I've never seen that cross not work. I've seen it several times throughout my career with Purina, but just on a personal basis in our own commercial cow 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 as well. So, the other thing I would say is this. We, uh, we've been developing bulls all across the nation for quite some time, and I can tell you that it doesn't matter what breed it is. It really doesn't. We've all got a rumen. We've all got a small intestine. We've got a large intestine, and all of them are the same. Okay? There are fundamental principles that you need to follow in any facet of nutrition in the cow industry, but particularly when we're thinking about developing bull, there are several things we have to juggle at the same time, keep in balance to make sure that at the end of the day we have two things. Number one, we have a bull that can actually go out and do his job, which is to breed cows immediately in fairly harsh conditions. I would dare say most of you, you sell bulls in commercial cow business. They're probably not going to put them in an environment like you have them in the day you see. And then secondly, from the standpoint of making as much money as we can in the seed stock business, we also have to have the cattle look the part. We have to have them looking a certain way such that your customers will actually come and look at them and spend some money on them and actually invest in the genetics that you put together. So there's a delicate balance there. We're going to talk about how to do that. And I'm going to share with you a lot of nutritional principles today, but I'm also going to share with you how our programs work based off the nutritional principles we think are important. Because I can tell you that just giving you some nutritional principles and not telling you how to apply them really doesn't mean you do. So that's why we're here today and very happy to be here today. Now, this next slide kind of pertains to what I just said. When it comes to bull development, you have to begin with the end of mind. You cannot wait until 30 days before you're ready to sell your bulls to make critical decisions. Your critical decisions on bull development, successful bull development, start way before you're ready to sell those bulls. Way before. 
Here's kind of the general outline that I would say that you need to follow or break things down into these categories and think about them specifically. And we'll talk about some of these. But you need to understand it's a process. It's very much a process. It's not one size fits all. It's not uh, as easy as some people make it sound. And be careful, be very careful to take one idea and run with it. Because again, bull development is a delicate balance between having a sound animal that can breed cows functionally, but also an animal that looks good as the people actually want to buy. So here's how it goes for us. Number one, we're going to spend a fair amount of time on this. Start right. And what I'm talking about specifically here is the weaning phase. That first week, two weeks after you wean them can make or break your bull belt program. Period. So we're going to spend a lot of time on starting this down right. The second part is kind of the lengthy part of the bull development program, and that's after you get them off to a good start and off the weaning program, how are you going to grow them? How are you going to grow them until you get them to that yearling weight and you get your yearling information on those bulls, or do you take them to 18 months old before you sell them? That long time frame there, how are you going to grow up effectively? Again, a delicate balance of how you do that for a time there. Thirdly, we call the cell prep phase. Dr. Hawkins, my counterpart in Texas, is going to spend a fair amount of time with you this afternoon talking specifically at or around the time of sale, whether that's the reproduction sale or sell on a private treaty in a certain time frame. How do you take care of those bulls to optimize how they look, but again, keep them sound? And then finally, we're going to talk about post-sale management. How do you take care of mature bulls? And I think maybe this, this applies to you guys, obviously. You've got bulls on your place. Even if you have an aggressive AI or a feature fertilization embryo transfer program, you're still going to have bulls on your place. Clean up bulls. But this is partly for you guys to help educate your customers. When they take those bulls home and they kick them out on the cows, how do they need to take care of those bulls moving forward? to where you don't get that call six months later, hey, this bull crashed, whatever, and then you go investigate the situation, they turn them out on sticks and stones and didn't take care of them. So there's things you can do to help educate your customers, too, and hopefully some of that information will bring that to life and give you something to share with your customers that they drive off your place. So we're going to talk about all four of these. I'm going to talk specifically about one, two, and four. Dr. Hawkins will visit with you in depth about number three. Now, I would tell you, before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of this, the most important thing you have to have in a good bull belt program, and I'm talking about you, is patience. Do not think that you can create what you want in a month. Because doing bull belts like too aggressively, too fast, is going to cause problems. I want you to think about this with some big this is a semi-annual bull on our place up in this picture in June 2015. That's about a month after we went. Okay? That's a little hard to see. You can tell he's green. I'm not ready to sell that bull a month after I went. Mean. Okay? But with patience, that's what this bull looks like this today. By aggressively pushing one, you don't have that result. By patiently, methodically, soundly developing the bull, you can get one to look sellable in four or five months fairly easily. But you don't want any of those peaks and valleys where you're pushing too hard or not enough. You want a good, consistent plan of nutrition for optimal growth. That's really what I like to so, Developing bulls is kind of like weight on that bed ball line. It doesn't happen overnight. You want to enjoy it like you're supposed to. It takes time, it takes passion. Okay, number one, start cattle right. I said this a moment ago, but I'll say it again. You can wreck a set of bulls the first week after you win. And there's really no use to continue to develop the program. There's a lot of things going on in this phase that may have wrecked the program. Dr. Hawkins and I just spent four days in Florida at a meeting. And one of our keynote speakers there was Dr. Mick Bailey. He's an immunologist from Bristol University in England. And he spent about an hour talking to us about just the effects of microorganisms in the lower gut of animals and how that affects their immune system. And the key 
key point I took out of that session is that there are two events in life that dictate the healthiness of that lower gut, that dictate the health of that apple. When they're warm and when they're weak. It can drastically affect our life, health, and performance. Those two events by how you treat them. This is why this event is so critical. We're going to go into the depth of why it's so critical and all the changes that are taking place with this animal. But folks, I'm telling you, if you don't pay attention to how you eat those pets, if you shoot from the hip, you're going to regret it. Especially on bulls. Because there's pecking order issues in bulls that you don't deal with in heifers and steers. It will absolutely change the complexion of your bull without the bull. Primary goals of starting cat. You get three primary goals. Some of these are going to seem obvious, but what's not so obvious is how to achieve. Number one, avoid sick cats. Y'all have been in the beef industry very long. You know this is the primary goal. Okay? The way you do that is you get them on feed quickly. There cannot be a lapse of a day or two days or even really half a day, in my opinion, where they don't eat feed. And there are things that we can do to get them in the feed bunk. Hours after we wait. We can do that. We're providing nutrients that allow that immune system to work properly. They fight off infection. Now they're going to actually express your genetic potential. The other thing that this starting phase does is it prepares them for the next phase of program. If you're talking about a week or two weeks or even three weeks after we meet them, sets them up for the rest of their life. Sets them up especially for the exact next phase, which is that growing phase. But these are the three primary goals. If you forget anything else we talked about today, remember this slide. You do this, and you're going to be okay. Okay. What's going on during weaning that actually causes this stress that's so detrimental to health and performance? Well, let's think about all the things that are going on. Obviously, just the weaning process itself is going to cause stress. I have my mother today standing next to me when I need her. Today she's gone. That's a huge deal. We don't understand that completely when it comes to beef cattle. We really don't. But I promise you, if you just bring that back home a little bit, think about your kids. When they go off to kindergarten that first day, there's some serious stress. I'm telling you, it was for me as a kid. I was a farm kid. I had maybe one or two friends out at the cotton gin, and I didn't know anybody else. I get to elementary school, and man, it's a brand new world. I was stressed. That's why kids get sick when they go to school. They bring that home with parents. Did. So we got to remember just the act of taking mother away, she's no longer there as a buffer, causes stress. Secondly, shipping. And, and folks here, I'm not talking about shipping stress taking them from Florida to Kansas. I'm talking about this is the pasture they've been in their entire life. Now all of a sudden they're in this pen that looks nothing like the pasture they were in for six months ago. That's stress. It's a new environment. A new environment, new stress. <laughs> so mainly, we want to talk about a serious stressor that we completely don't understand. Especially you guys in the purebred business, weaning bulls. This commingling deal is huge. You ever just sit there after you wean a set of bull calves and wash them? After you put them in a pen together without their mothers? Pipes, push, beller. One minute they look like a little hand, and the next minute they try to, they're trying to be the bullies full of the pen. They're confused. There's pecking order reestablishment that maybe wasn't established in the pasture that causes stress, just like it does in human beings. Diet change. This is one we're going to spend a fair amount of time because there are things we can do to help alleviate the stressors of diet change. There are things you can do to make this easier on the cat. We're going to go into that part of this. So we'll talk about that now. Processing. You run up through the chute, you give them a couple shots, maybe you deworm them, you do it again two, two weeks later, and you're branded. There's a lot of stuff going on with processing. You've never done these butters before, and all of a sudden, whoo, that's going to cause stress. And then the thing we absolutely can't control is weather. Our best intentions sometimes kind of get shot in the foot because the weather event comes in. And I'm not necessarily talking about what we've got coming in today. 
Sometimes it's just a change in barometric pressure. That has drastic effects on intake and how that moves. So there are things that we cannot control, obviously. But other than weather, folks, I will tell you, every single one of these other things, you can help alleviate some of that stress by having that. If the day you bring them in and we have a process of the food and hollering and hot shot and all that kind of stuff, you're going to make it work. You do it slowly, you do it quietly, you kind of maybe have been in there before. A lot of those things can be alleviated. We're going to talk specifically about that. I'm going to tell you there's things we can do to manipulate that starting diet that can help alleviate some of that diet change. But anyway, if you don't take care of these stressors, now you're underwater, you have a disease state, so it won't be the same animal again. So we have to prevent that from happening. Morbidity and performance. I'm going to share with you some commercial cattle data, but it applies to, to the purebred industry as well. It just absolutely does. A really neat little study there at AM where they looked at healthy cattle versus sick cattle the first few days after weaning. And they said, how did the health of that calf affect two things? Number one, the gain of those calves, and how did that relate back to the intake of feed on those calves? Okay. So this first section here is the daily gain. You've got daily gain the first week, daily gain the first month, and the daily gain the first two months after week. You've got two years of cattle, healthy cattle, sick cattle, about 300 to 385 heads of fruit. You can see the first week, the healthy cattle did not lose as much weight as the sick cattle. Over the first month, the healthy cattle gained a pound three, the sick cattle didn't gain anything. Over the first two months, the healthy cattle gained two pounds a day, the sick cattle still didn't gain anything, even two months post me. Now you say, well, what was going on there? Why are they healthy? Why are they sick? Why did the healthy cattle gain more than the sick cattle? Let's take a look at the feed intake. Again, the first week, month, two months. The healthy cattle say about a percent and a half body weight that first week. The sick cattle only ate a little under a percent of life. Over the first month, the healthy cattle ate up to 2.7% of body weight versus only 1.84% of body weight. Over the first two months after weaning, the healthy cattle ate 3% of body weight, the sick cattle actually ate 2.7% of body weight. So the healthy cattle ate more than the sick cattle. So there's a couple of things I want to point out here. Number one, remember that first slide? Avoid sick cattle, and how do you get that done? You need to start eating quickly. And you can see the healthy cattle, they gain more. They, they, that means they're healthy, and that's because of that. They, or they did that because they ate. But the other interesting thing is this. Take a look at this. If you look at the intake of these two groups of cattle, healthy versus sick, over two months, the sick cattle nearly ate as much as the healthy cattle if you look at it over a two-month time. But still didn't gain strong. Because of what happened this first week. So when you look at that from a feed efficiency standpoint, the sick cattle are actually eating as much feed as the healthy cattle that weren't gaining anything, but because of what happened to them that first week after you weaned them, you couldn't get them to eat feed, it drastically changed how they performed two months out. Well, I'll tell you, it goes further than that. You will mess them up for the rest of their life. If you don't get them on feed quickly, you can keep them out. Texas a and Branch to Rail data from 92 to 2001 indicated healthy cattle are about 92 bucks more ahead. It's probably double that if you look at the economics now. But why is that? Well, healthy cattle are more profitable because they grow. Why do healthy cattle grow? Because they eat. Again, if they don't have the nutrients in their digestive tract, to help fight off disease, to boost that immune system, it doesn't matter what you put in front of them. If you, if you put something in front of them that, from a formulation standpoint, looks unbelievable, but they won't eat it, it does you no know good. It's just a great little feed tag. You've got to get their head in front of eat food. So, let's talk about some common misconceptions that help improve intake up front. Number one, this is a big pet peeve for me. The creep ration is not the starting ration. What am I getting at here? Creep ration is not the starting ration. Well, if the creep ration is not the starting ration, what's the big difference? <coughs> rubbish about Rubbish. When I use the word rubbish, I want you to think scratch back. I want you to think bigger particle size. When it goes into the rumen, it scratches that rumen wall. It causes the rumen motility to get better. It causes the bacteria in that rumen to become more mobile. It catches the feed better. It also elevates the pH. Rumen pH needs to be 
good things for that room to help the lifetime of productivity to happen. Now then, let's address the idea of rubbish and fiber are not always the same thing. So what I'm getting at here is somebody comes to me and says, you know what, here's the kind of starting ration you need to have to have on. It's really high in fiber. That's going to be good for them. You need to step back and say, I don't really care what fiber is. What's the rubbish of Because they're not always the same thing. We've got four byproducts these that are commonly used in our industry now to provide nutrition. We've got corn gluten feed, soybean holes, oat holes, and boxy holes. All four of those ingredients are extremely high in fiber. Whether you look at it as total dietary fiber or neutral detergent fiber, you look across here, and you can see that all four of those feeds are very, very high in fiber. So you say, wow, that's good. That's a good thing. Maybe it is, maybe it is. If you look at the ruminal pH when these byproducts are used, you can see that corn gluten feed and soy holes both cause ruminal acidosis. Whereas other holes and top seed holes keep that ruminal pH up closer to the Other holes and top seed holes provide rubbish. Corn gluten feed and soybean holes provide <coughs> highly digestible fiber that actually acts more like corn in the ruminal than fiber that comes from top seed. Okay. By far and away, your best rubbish sources are coxie holes and hay. They provide that particle size and that scratch factor in the ribbon to stimulate ribbon motility, to elevate ribbon pH, and to do another thing that you all have seen your whole lives kind of do when they're happy. Yeah. Rubbish causes them to chew their gut. One of the first things you could go up, you need to, when you evaluate your cattle, are my cattle healthy, or my cattle doing good, and are they having a problem? One of the first things I look at when I go out to get a cattle, if they're laying down underneath the shade tree, I want to see them chewing their diet. That means they're getting rubbish in their diet, they're regurgitating that rubbish, chewing it again, and dropping it back down. You know the other thing that happens when they chew feather? They're not just chewing that food up into a little smaller particle size and helping them become more digestible. When you chew food, especially if you're eating salad or something like that, you notice that you produce a lot of saliva. When cattle chew their cud, they are producing copious amounts of saliva. They produce that saliva to help lubricate things in their mouth, and when they swallow that feed bowls back out of their room, and you know where that saliva goes? It goes with that feed bowls right back out of that room. The reason that's important is saliva actually has natural buffers in it that help elevate that room of the edge and keep it more optimal for fiber digestion and proper rich health. So there's a lots of good things to go on in that plenty of rubbish diet. Lots of good things. We talked about some of that because it makes them chew their gut and elevates room of the edge. But I want you to think about this for just a second. And I think if you kind of think about it like this and put things in perspective, it makes it it makes it real easy to understand why the free fraction is not the starting point. Understand the diet preference of the nursing calf. In other words, while that calf is still on side of the cow, what is their first preference for nutrition, second preference for nutrition, third, and on down? Well, the nursing calf, first preference for nutrition, no matter what, is mother's milk. As long as she'll stand there and let them nurse, that's where they're going first for milk. Or for nutrition. It's just the way it is. If you have a good quality print feed out, their next preference for nutrition is going to be the print feed. Now, if it's not a good print feed, then they don't want to go eat it, then we got other issues. But that's probably going to be their second preference for nutrition. And then their final preference for nutrition is going to be your corn. So first is mother's milk, second is your print feed, third is the corn. Now, we wean the cat. How does that change? What's the diet preference of a wean cat? If you wean your cat on creep feed, what becomes number one preference for nutrition? Creep feed. And mother's milk's gone. There's nothing to curb that, cur cur that cat's appetite. Their first preference for nutrition becomes everything. So if you're using a creep feed, that's creep feed. And that you have in the second. So why is that important? 
you don't have any milk intake, which occur pre feed intake. So if you're pre feeding too high in energy and not high enough in roughage, the mother's milk is no longer first preference for nutrition pre feeds number one. What are they probably going to do on their pre feed? They're going to eat too much. There's not enough roughage, it's too high in energy to prevent ruminal acidosis, to cause them to chew their cud and have all those positive things we talked about. Free ration doesn't have enough rubbish to prevent bloat and acidosis in that starting phase because mother's milk is gone. First preference for nutrition is creep feed. It's too high in energy, too low in rubbish. Now we got methodology. You need a true starter at rubbish. We'll talk about why that is here in just a minute. But I'd also like to let you know that we have another five pound fed bag product called Stress Care 5 we'll talk about. It's really nice protein and has no rubbish, but it's a low input low intake products so we're not feeding a bunch of this at one time for each one. So there's three different programs. We'll talk about them specifically why they're different and what's appropriate at what time. Just so I know who I'm busy with, how many of you have ever used our free complete product? Quite a few. Would you not say the best thing about free con is the cavity? I mean literally day one, naive calves I've seen calves that have never seen people, never seen humans before, stick their head in the bunk and eat the green on the first day. And remember, our first goal in avoiding sick cows is to get to eat these quickly. And free con helps keep that done. So that's why it's really unique. It's got a lot of roughage in it. So when they do stick their head in it and eat it, if they take a big pill on it, it's going to be safe for them. It's going to keep that room pH where it needs to be. It's going to make them chew their cut. Here's just a summary of pre-con trials from 86 to the middle 2000s. You can see over 125,000 head, three weeks on feed, three pounds a day, and a conversion of 5.1. It's really not uncommon for pre-con. You can get that kind of performance the first two or three weeks after you wean them on product like this. Again, because they eat it immediately. They didn't start eating it like they were supposed to on day one. It was like that. So that's why I share that day. If you're going to use a product like Precon, a traditional starter with plenty of rubbish, there are things you have to do from a management standpoint to still make it successful. Because like I said before, it may be the most nutritionally balanced product you can put in front of those cattle. And they may eat it day one, but if you don't do some things from a management standpoint, you won't have the kind of success you need to really make it a profit, profitable venture. I always say day one is still provide that. Even with the, the starter and the pen, because they understand they understand what that is. A good starter like Precon, you'll see them actually choose Precon over the day, but you'll have a certain percentage of them still like these little days, especially day one and day two. If you're going to sell feed Precon, there are things you need to do with your bulk feeder to make that thing work like it's supposed to. I actually recommend that you can feed Precon on, on bulls, especially being intake tools, but if you're going to sell feed, there's things you need to do. You need to adjust your feeders properly. You need about two fingers width at the bottom of that tray. So you got a bulk feeder, you put the feed in, you need only about two fingers width at the bottom of that feeder gate in that tray. If you open it up any more than that, you're going to have problems. Because you say, well, I'm going to open it up so I need more. Actually, the exact opposite happens. The further you open that tray up, Feed gets in that bump, it causes fines. And fines take on moisture from the atmosphere, and then now all of a sudden you got more to feed. So you got to dig stuff out, you got them instead of having 15 foot of bump space on each side of that feeder, you might have two or three because everything else is stopped up and all fines. You have two fingers with you make them work at it a little bit, your bumps will stay cleaner, you have less moldy feed, your feeder won't stop up. It's just a way better afternoon. You only have two fingers. You'll need to clean out fines at least once a week, really multiple times a week. Inevitably, there's going to be a few fines. Fines cause blood. The less of that you have in your feeder tray, the better off you're going to be. Always provide enough pump space. I don't care if this is on a bulk feeder, on a feed trough, in the starting phase, you better have at least, at least a foot of pump space in it. Especially for bulls. Because again, if you watch your cattle, you watch what happens, especially in a bullpen, just because you have a bunch of feeder space doesn't mean everybody gets their fair shot. The 
Because if you watch what happens, there's going to be one or two bulls up there, and they're going to give their little ones a bullet when they come up there the first time. And they're not going to come back like they're supposed to unless you have plenty of prospects. Just telling you, I want you to have heartache and heartbreak over this deal, and at least a foot of my space, especially when we're talking about adult bulls. If you're going to hand pick pre comp, which is actually the way I'd recommend you do it in terms of developing bulls, Couple things that are a little different here. So you're going to hand feed out and have you leave out a free choice. Again, precon is the most powerful feed in the industry. Period. I can't take the ingredients that you have on your place and make it be more powerful than what precon is. They're going to eat precon, they're going to choose it over hay. So if you're hand feeding a couple times a day, what we're trying to do is prevent appetite buildup between those feeds. So you keep a good medium quality type of hay out, something between 8 and 12 percent protein. Free choice in that pen, that way when you come feed the free pond, they're not starving to death, they won't eat a whole bunch at one time and get blood for a difference. But you still need plenty of bunk space, at least a foot of bunk space per head. And that can be manipulated up if you've got bigger calves, but at least a foot of bunk space per head. I want you to closely monitor intake too. Once your cattle are comfortably eating three to three and a half percent of body weight, those cattle are telling you they're ready to go to the next step of the growing phase. They're telling you, hey, I'm healthy. I'm good, I'm ready to go. But if you're still two weeks into a weaning program and you can barely get them to eat two and a half percent body weight, you need to keep them on starving. They're telling you they're not quite ready to go to the next step in growing phase. So closely monitor intake. For us as a pure eater representative, you say, hey, feed them three percent body weight per head today. Okay, that's good that you do that, but you need to monitor your bumps too. Are they eating all that? Are they telling me they're ready to go the next thing or do we have no one thing I don't want you to do on any of these programs is limit feed to anything. And that's why I ask you to keep the A out for your choice if you're getting feed pre con because what happens is if you start limit feeding something, we tell you 3% body weight intake is what your target is, and you've made up in your mind, I'm only feeding 1%, I promise you you're going to have problems. Because you're going to have hungry cattle when you come out to feed. Really hungry, aggressive cattle to come on something that's palatable and causes problems. They eat too much feed at one time, it causes the pH to go down, you have acidosis, you're going to have blow, scours, and other issues. So again, follow the directions, don't let it feed. Blow the curve when you let it feed, and let it feed reduces gain. They're not going to gain as much on 1% of the body weight as they are for I mean, that's just the laws of energy. We'll talk about that more here in this morning, too. But follow these rules. Now this is something that gets forgotten. And I recognize that everybody's place is different. Okay? But there are certain things you can do with regard to where you put your feeder and your water troughs and your feed troughs and where you put your hay that can absolutely dictate the success of your starting program. Ideally, cattle should have about 500 square feet of pen space. I know that it'll be a little less and it'll be a little more in different situations. But I want you to good, just use good cowboy logic here. If you take 20 calves that you just weaned off the cows and you turn them in a 200 acre pasture, the feeder's up here by the gate, what's going to happen? You're not going to see those cattle for a week. For that entire week, what are they not doing? They're not eating feed. And when they don't eat quickly, what happens? They get sick. <coughs> by the same token, you don't want to stick 200 head in a room this size. Because then you get all the other problems that come, especially in a fall like we're having now. Man, before long, they're going to be mop deep in mud. There's going to be no dry place to lay down. And again, on bulls with pecking order, you got to give enough room to get away from one another so they can rest, so they can relax. If they're not relaxing, what's the opposite of relaxation? Stress. Stress causes sickness. So again, use good body. But this is a good starting place to base on. The other thing I would tell you is put your finger water and your feeder perpendicular to your fence. It's probably a little hard for you to see. But here's a couple of both feeders that are right behind the fence. So in other words, here's the fence. See that feeder perpendicular to that fence. When you turn a new set of wing calves into a pen, what do they do? Around and around and around that pen they go. If your water and your feed bumps are on that fence, they're going to run and feed water fairly quickly. 
can't do that hand up hand that's too big. Hand that's too small, they never get to it. So put your finger in water perpendicular mass that just promotes again that feed intake, which promotes nutrition getting in their body, which helps them buy all disease. Again, just go with that one body. Now for those of you that are fed free con, we said at the beginning, the best thing about free con is they eat it day one. They eat it a lot. That's also the worst thing about free con, right? For those of you that have had to keep them on free con for an extended period of time, well before long, man, healthy cattle, they're going through that stuff. Again, that's why I ask you to closely monitor the intake. Because the cattle are going to tell you when they're ready to go something else. If your cattle have been pre fed so they already know how to eat, they're not scared to walk up to the feeder or to the feed trough, you might consider after ration starting. It's a little different product that helps avoid overconsumption that we sometimes give the cattle to know how to eat on our pre con Again, if you've got really naive cats that have never seen feeders, that have never seen people, that have never seen feed, pre is a great cattle to start on. But if you have cattle that know how to eat, that you fit, the Accuration Starter Program is a really nice fit in that scenario. The Accuration Starter Theory, basically what we're doing with the Accuration Starter is we're modifying intake of the starter. And I know this is going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, I just got through saying it on the fact that we avoid sick cattle by getting them to eat quickly and getting them to eat a lot. <coughs> we big eaters that already know how to eat, but we've had overconsumption issues on a traditional starter. What we're trying to make them do now is we're trying to make them go to feed early, but instead of standing there and eating two or three big meals a day, we want them to come back and eat six to eight smaller meals. So where that nutrition goes into their room at a more metered fashion, and it allows for that room to be to stay higher, Again, remember when our river movement pH is closer to neutral, we have a healthy river, healthy bacteria, no metabolic issues. And that's what we have sometimes with prep fed cattle, which genetically the eaters are really palatable starter feed. They eat a whole bunch, they don't feel so good, they come back later after they feel good again, and we kind of get some of that yield going away. Accuration starter helps alleviate this problem. So we're living over consumption without living feed. And by doing that, we have healthy cattle that still. Very unique program. After the starter actually has reduced roughage and more energy in the starter phase, we can get away with that because we have these intake modifiers that make them become stack eaters. So as important as roughage is, we can get away with less roughage in our product like after ration starter because we're making these smaller meals more frequently throughout the day so we don't have this huge flush of grain in their room at one time. It really works nicely for pre-fed, bigger calves, and purebred outfits. We have a lot of purebred folks that really, really like this program. It's a little different looking than pre-con. Pre-con is a nice green pellet. This is a texture feed. You can kind of see this picture here. There's three basic ingredients. We have a pre-mixed pellet, loose cracked corn, and loose cotton seed bowls. It's bound together with some molasses. It's very, very pretty feed. In fact, some people have actually used it Show it's very resistant to moisture, it's very durable for handling because we're not talking about a Sometimes pre-con, when it gets a little moisture on it, like for instance, if you had pre-con in the feeder last weekend, what happened? At least if the pre-con was in the box. You better go clean that thing out. I promise you, moisture is a man like that, that pellet's it's going to explode. You don't have to worry about that nearly as much for that can we have reduced concern with flow on active ration starter because of the snag eating, and because of that, we have improved performance in a prolonged feeding period. If you have to keep your calves in a weaning pen for longer than a couple weeks, active ration starters are real nice for you guys. Because you can keep them on it longer than you can pre con, and not have to worry about it overeating the product and getting into the pellets. So it's a really flexible program, too, for these bigger eating pre fed calves. Now, some of the management of this program is a little bit like pre but a little bit different some of us too. Day one, I still ask that you provide hay. Again, that's a comfort issue as much as anything for those guys. But really, on after your ration starter, after day one, you don't need the hay out anymore. Because you will actually have calves choose hay over after your ration starter because of the intake modifiers that are in it. So if you want to use after your ration starter, day one is fine, but after that, they need to be on the after. This is the preferred method of self-feeding it. If 
if you're not going to sell things after your asking starter, you're really not getting the back of the bucks. I'll be realistic. Because the value of this product is being able to put it in a cell feeder, kind of takes care of itself in terms of producing that log issue from the main effect. You want to have a little different adjustment on your feeder deck with that direction star versus free con. Free con we wanted two fingers with, with that direction star we want three fingers with, from the bottom of that feed tray to the bottom, or to the bottom of your feed deck. Because it is coarse in its texture, it's got loose holes on the outside, it doesn't flow quite as well, not as well as the pellet. So three fingers with is what we're asking you to do there. Again, just like three con, clean out fine when you have them. At least a foot of bunk space for dead. And like I said before, remove hay completely after day one of this program. If you don't, you'll have a certain percentage of those calves that won't come to the feeder like they're supposed to. Where is the free con airplane? I'll just say avoid hand feeding. If you're, you're hand feeding, you're missing the boat on the value of this product. If you use pre con before and then you decide that this day I want to try after your action starter, I don't want you to be alarmed when you don't see them eat as much. Again, we're talking about more energy and less roughage in after your action starter, so they don't have to eat as much. And they'll actually gain more weight and do okay. 10 to 15 percent less in pre con week one, 7 to 10 percent less intake of pre con overall. So again, don't be alarmed if it takes a little while to get the 3 percent body weight versus the pre con. So quickly. Again, do not let it be. Do not let your bunks go in. Again, the worst thing you can have in the medium pen is a really hungry cat. Because number one, we know they're hungry. If they're hungry, they haven't been eating feed, so they don't have the nutrients they need to fight off disease. But number two, when you introduce feed, they're going to eat too much. You're going to have their own pH decrease. You're going to have acidosis, and that starts all the other dominoes falling that off. Same rules, pin space and arrangement, at least 500 square foot of bunk space per head. Excuse me, a uh, pin space per head would be a starting place. You can see here the fence, the weaning pin here. You can see that the feeders are perfectly clear to that fence. Again, turn those caps in, they're going to go around that fence, around that fence. They're going to run into a feeder and have those feet come up there. I want to visit with you a little bit about our Stress Care 5 supplement. Uh, for those of you that produce really good forage, and I know it's been extremely difficult to do the last few years for various reasons, at least in my part of the world, we produce a lot of forage, but it ain't really good. It either got land on or it got too mature before we can cut it. What I'm talking about is if you have forage that's consistently, a lot of times we call it forage, 10% grid protein or better, pretty good stuff, we have a really nice low input program that you can start calves on with that really high quality. The five pound fed rate starter, but you have to have good forage to go with it for it to work. If your forage isn't good enough, you'll be disappointed when you use this program. 23% crude protein is higher in protein because it's only five pounds, but you can it's more like 15. On the big starter. It's got the Zenpro level four trace minerals in it, just like our other starters do to help prevent disease. And it's got enhanced palatability. We actually found in the research study we did in our research farm that cattle actually went to the stress care pile before they did free time. That's how palatable it truly is. Very convenient, five pound fed rate, but again, I want to emphasize that unless you have at least 10% crude protein forage, do not use the protein. You will be disappointed. So just make sure your forage quality dictates the use of this program. It will add gains to the starter program over just pasture and hay. And uh, it's designed to be extremely palatable so that even if you have really good hay, they're still going to come eat that five pounds per day. But we have to tell you about it because some of you do produce outstanding forage, just maybe something you want to look at. In a, in a weaning program, and I mentioned this just a little bit, but I always mention it here because I think it's important to kind of emphasize this. Protein and energy and roughage are all extremely important parts of a good starting nutrition program. We talked about some of that, especially the roughage. Good mineral nutrition is unbelievably important in the weaning phase. We learn more and more each day about the value, particularly some of these trace minerals, in helping boost the immune system. Copper, zinc, selenium, cobalt, some of these things are extraordinarily important in helping boost the mechanisms in the, in the body that actually fight off disease. So we have good mineral packages in these starters, but we also recommend putting out a good mineral supplement in the pen as well. For 
particularly our code molasses based mineral milk. Because when you put something in molasses, what used to happen? It makes it really attractive. Even to a naive cat, it's just good. And so if you put your mineral supplement in a molasses based package, you're going to get cats come to that way more frequently than in just a typical loose uh, form. I want to share with you some data out of Nebraska where we use these good molasses based mineral tubs and starting receiving bins and how that actually affected the health of those calves. We did a two year Piedmont trial. We had five splits of calves over two years, preconditioned and non preconditioned calves. And basically, what we did is we placed these tubs in receiving bins. We had about 40 to 45 calves per tub. And our goal was to have these mineral tubs in front of these cattle for at least the first three weeks of the preconditioned phase. They consumed a faster than that, and they put out additional stuff. We took weights on arrival and at finish, and we also collected more big and more talent today. Okay? Here's the day. Just so you know, this wasn't some fly by night deal. We had about a thousand head on each treatment. We had, again, one group that didn't get the mineral tub, the other group that did. If you look at this particular data set, you see, you can see there wasn't a, a huge difference in, in gain performance between the two sets of cattle. But the difference comes in the morbidity and the mortality. We had less deaths and less sick heads in the pens where we kept these mineral tubs out for the first three weeks. And I'll tell you that, come to a picture here, this is an outfit I worked with in the hill country, just here not too long ago, they mean calves. You'll see calves licking on these things throughout the day. So as your big bully bull calves are up here getting a little feed, if you have these mineral tubs at the opposite end of the pen, they're back there licking on that. And when the big bull calves come back, it kind of gives everything a nice transition in the pen. It gets them off of one another. And by the same token, when they're licking these mineral tubs and gaining these viable minerals to help with the immune system, you know what else they're producing when they're licking that tub? Where are they producing when they're chewing their cut? Right. Can you just think about yourself whenever you're licking a lot of pump or something like that, then you got lots of saliva. And again, the more saliva we can get them to secrete and get back in that rumen, the better we're going to be able to have them hold that rumen and be able to produce the So this is just another low cost way of helping boost the immune system at a starting period. Now, we'll tell you that there are other helpful management tools. Amy's cow will always eat more than anything else. Plus, end up cattle like beef masters typically eat less, which is good for you guys. Generally speaking, they're more feed efficient. And the smaller the starting pin, the higher the intake. This is one that I have to kind of really uh, remind people about quite a bit because, folks, it means everything the location of that feeder for those cows. Again, if you turn 20 head and 200 acres, you're not going to get intake like you had if you had those same 20 head in a room that's big. You just kind of got to keep all that stuff in mind. Good accountability logic can save you a lot of money. So remember those things. If you have two different sets of calves weaned at the same time, but you have different pins you're weaning them in, that's going to have an effect. So, house prevention is worth the pound of cure. I spent a lot of time talking about that weaning phase because, again, I've seen more bull development programs fail because what happened to those bulls a week or two after you weaned them than anything else we can do moving forward. The next phase, after we get them off to a good start, now we're going to grow those bulls. We're going to grow them to their yearlings, get some yearling information on them, we, we weigh them, we ultrasound them, and maybe we sell them at that time, or maybe we sell them a little later, at 18 months of age, whatever it is. What are we going to do with those bulls to effectively grow them? After we get them off to a good start, now what are we going to do to effectively grow them until we get ready to sell them? We've done a good job at the starting phase. This becomes way easier. But there are things you have to pay attention to in this phase as well. And I take a real practical approach to how I visit with people like you guys on this phase because until I understand what your needs are, I can't help. You. I'm fortunate because I'm in the business too, and we grow and develop and sell bulls too. And I've kind of gained a lot of knowledge and experience. <coughs> Personally, but everybody's got a few things that are a little bit different. So there's a couple questions or a couple comments that I always get when we visit with somebody the first time about full cell. <coughs> what do they ask me when they're quizzing about a bull cell program? I need these bulls to gain three and a half, four pounds a day on very low feet. <laughs> and we laugh, but Basically, that can be translated as, I need them to gain something on nothing. <laughs> I'm 
we have a little association with that folks. Bottom line is, according to the laws of energy, that's impossible. Second law of thermodynamics, energy can never be created or destroyed. If you want this bull to gain, he's going to have to eat. Okay? If you're okay with him not gaining, then he's going to have to eat. But we all have to be a little realistic. It, it is an expensive task to develop a bullying kind. But you don't want to halfway do it and wind up with something that you know nobody wants. So you have to be realistic. Really, at the end of the day, you guys are concerned with the efficiency, and I am too. Whatever program we put in front of those bulls for that four, five, six month period needs to be efficient. We can't have them eating 35 to 50 pounds ahead of day and something and only get two pounds out of it. Because that's not cost effective. So we're concerned with feed efficiency. I'll tell you that our active ration programs allow for better feed efficiency, and I'll explain why that is here in just a minute. And I'm talking specifically about our active ration forage extender program. And I'll talk about why it's different. Because it allows for feed efficiency, but it's got some other things that are unique as well that are important to talk about this morning. But feed efficiency is absolutely important. So it's everything that's important. We're not trying to be, we're, here's what I would say. We're not trying to make them be as efficient as the feedlots here to fish. Right? Because what you have at the end of that is not going to reach out. But it does need to be efficient enough that it makes sense to you to come. Okay, the next question I always get when we're asking folks about bull development programs is this. I don't want my bulls to get fat, but they still need to look at it. Now, Depends on how honest you want to be about this, but how many of you have ever tried to sell a skinny bull? Is that easy? When they come to your place and you've got 20 bulls out there, which one do they pick? But we have to be realistic about what well, getting too fat does to them as well. So there's a responsibility on both ends of that. Here's what this can be translated as. What you're telling me when you say that, I need them to be sound, in good working shape, so they need to look good, but they need to still be in good sound working condition to where when my guy goes and turns them out on 50 cows in South Texas, he's not going to lose 200 pounds the first week. Some of that is genetic. We've got to pay attention to that. We've got to make sure it's even time matches our environment, no doubt. There are things we can do even with the best genetics to screw them up where they are going to melt when they get turned. So it's a two-way street, it all works together, but this is something that has to be addressed. I get it. You guys, as developers of bulls and sellers of bulls, you want a good reputation and repeat customers. That's the name of the game. If you sell a bull that looks great today and take him home and falls apart, you're probably going to get that guy back. And that's a really tough deal. Or you may get a call that he wants to replace him. You've been down that road too. The Accuration Forging Center allows for soundness and leaner game. We talk about feed efficiency is important. We talk about keeping the sounds important. <coughs> one of the things we talk about in that starter phase is so important to that healthy room and that healthy animal. Rough, right? So how do we make it feed efficiency, feed efficient, but also have this important rough? The Accuration Forging Center I'm a technology product that makes it eat snack meals a day, but it also has roughage in it. Roughage is cotton seed which I said is so important. The proper room and health. Folks, at the end of the day, this is how this is how simple really ruined nutrition is. If you have a healthy room, you know what else you're gonna have? Healthy cat. It all revolves around that room. The product called forty standard it has built-in roughage that allows for soundness and leaner death. Because it has roughage in the formulation. I want you to remember, chew that cud. The only forage extender program, one of the first things you notice when those bulls are out laying underneath the tree, chewing their cud. They're relaxed. Their stools are not too firm. They're not blowing out their backside. First thing I do when I go out to a group of cattle, I look, are they chewing their cud? If they're laying down when they get up, when they poop, does it go from here, 30 foot out? Does it stack? Or is it right where we want it to be? Stacks in the same spot. We don't have best cuts. The 40 center program really helps the <clears throat> action. Alright. Why does it work the way it works? Why can we 
new product like this and be fuel efficient but also have the rubber component in it. Why is it different from a traditional full development product? And I'll tell you, I'm a nutritionist. I work pretty much uh, all of South Texas, most of Central Texas, Gulf Coast of Louisiana, every single place I have developed rations that we think about for somebody. They say, hey, I got these four ingredients, I want to buy something from you to do my rations. And I cannot make those bulls look like a four consumer bull so far. Because inevitably, even if it's a high solid ration, or a silage slash hay ration, we get into feed, issue, feed efficiency issue. If, if I get put in that we want more grain in there because we want it to go, then now we got messy butts and long toes and bloats. So again, what I told you in the very beginning, rural development is this delicate balance. Feed efficiency and a program that actually makes a game, but keeps them sound, keeps that gut healthy, and makes them healthy before they go to the cows. Why are these active ration programs different? Particularly, why is active ration for these different? Well, number one, and this is something I typically skip over, but it's a free choice feed program. It is absolutely a time-saving, way to do it, but I'll tell you something else. We have less crippled bulls because of injury on this program than we do when we our body. Why do you think that is? When the feed truck comes down and puts feet out for those bulls, what happens? I mean, they beat the heck out of each other, particularly if you don't have enough blood and you get more injuries and those sorts of things. You don't have that we have on cell feeder before we Another thing that's important from a nutritional standpoint is it allows for that multiple meals per day to provide that nutrition in a safer and more efficient manner. We get, we're getting back to talk about that snack that you get, just like we talked about with that grass and starter. You can make them eat smaller meals at a time and deliver that nutrition in a smaller amount of room at a time to keep that room the pH elevated and rubbish helps you get that done. Smaller meals higher room of pH, more roughage, higher room of pH, more roughage, more chewing up the cud, more saliva back to the ribbon, higher room of pH. To keep the ribbon healthy, to keep the bull healthy. More you see for allows for that. The other thing that's important for you guys too, you got them on a program, you say, hey, our farmer, I need them. We, we got this day here, they weigh this. I sell them at this point here, I need them to gain three and a half pounds a day. Okay? This program also allows for the consumption of making it more consistent and optimal gain. Again, like I told you in the beginning, we're, we do not want to try to do anything in a month or even two months. That's when you wreck bulls. It's a gradual, meter process. Forty center allows for that. We're looking for optimal performance on forage. We try to use our forage as a resource. Use the forage center with your pasture or with your hay. You got cottonseed cup holes coming from forage extender and you got roughage coming from your pasture and hay. Now you got two of the best roughage sources you can possibly have going into that bull room every day. You're going to see them chew the cup. You're going to see them have a the time again. And that's what this program allows for. Optimal performance on grass. Let me ask you this question. What's the greatest resource you have on your ranch? And this is kind of a tricky question because I'm talking to a bunch of seed stock guys. Realize that the genetics you have on your place, the genetics you have in your tanks, are extraordinarily important. But I would argue, of course, I'm biased, I'm a nutritionist, the most viable resource you have on your ranch. Without that, what do you really have? You got a bunch of feed yard now. And I think you guys probably recognize this or appreciate this more than anybody else I can speak with, and particularly guys in Texas and South Texas. Because you've experienced a long period of time without it. And you know how difficult it becomes to be a profitable rancher without it. So, what we try to do at Purina is we try to take any program, I don't care if it's bull development, hair development, root cow management, and use as much of your support as we can. Not just because that's the way it ought to be done to keep them sound, but also because that's the most economical way, in our opinion, to get it done. Here's a really nice piece of that that Dr. Hawkins really ought to be presenting to you. He was involved in this research at AM and he was there with Dr. Ford. But what we're looking at here is the performance and the fertility and the feed efficiency of two different kinds of bulls. Bulls were developed on a conventional ration, they were in a feed yard, on a traditional bull grower, versus cattle on an active ration and pasture. And you can see that the bulls on an active ration and pasture, they did not gain as much as the bulls standing up in that feed yard. But you take a look at scrolls, and I think that's really what a big difference. But the big deal for us is if you look at mobile square percent, normal square percent, 
uh, it is amazing how well those look after they've been on the floor for four or five months. They look like a different animal. Good question. I would not use sport extender on heifers unless I was completely out of order. On heifers, I still recommend using the cattle under program because we're talking about a much lower fed rate and using way more force than heifer did. Bull, we're talking about three to four pounds a day type gain. <clears throat> we really only need them to gain a pound and a half. So two vastly different gain goals. So cattle under are still a better program in my opinion for heifers. Good question. Great question. Yes, sir. Uh, at what age does the calves start developing a rumen? At what age do the calves start developing a rumen? It can actually be in their first week of life. And the reason I say that is we've had dairy calves that are weaned off the day, pretty close to the day they're born. And immediately when you start picking in something besides milk, that rumen starts to develop. What happens when they nurse is we get what we call a suckling reflex. There's actually this groove that the moment they start suckling, root takes shape and it actually causes this thing to go and bypass the root so it goes directly to the lower track. When it's not milk and they don't have that suckling reflex, they go down to the particular in the room and that starts to develop the bacteria that begins to develop. And they receive those bacteria and stuff through the environment through being around their mother and so forth. So it's, it's as early as day one if that's the kind of thing for you. Good question. We have good pasture with good protein, which is the best way to give some additives to, go to stimulate the consumption of that forage, but it's in a way the it's expensive way to do it. Right. Uh, our primary goal in stimulating forage intake revolves around two basic principles. Uh, number one, root pH. We we'll talked about quite a bit here today. The bacteria that are actually responsible for digesting the forage are what we call our fiber digesters are very sensitive to low pH. And so our goal on a pasture situation is to keep that pH at 6.0 or higher. If we do that, we've got a condition now in the room that the fiber digesters can survive. If they survive and digest, that causes them to digest more feed and leaves them quickly, quickly, quickly to eat more grass. The second thing we have to do is make sure that the balance of nutrients going to the bacteria are appropriate. Nine times out of ten, what we're primarily trying to do there is provide more degradable protein in the room uh, that actually is converted to ammonia. And the ammonia is actually the first growth limiting factor for higher digestive bacteria. And what you see on lower quality forages is the digestibility goes down, goes down so it's the protein. And so what we're trying to do is elevate the amount of protein going to the rumen, it gets broken down to ammonia, and now these bugs responsible for digesting and storage have more of the ingredient they need to grow and reproduce and do more digestive and storage. This program allows for that. We make an arm sure that there's plenty of protein in there and the snack eating effect in the rubbish level allows